G'day everyone, Mike here. Today we're going to be playing through the tutorial um, scenario for Voidfall on Tabletop Simulator. This is a game I've been absolutely obsessed with the last couple of weeks. I've played it just about every night this week. One, one memorable game lasted until about 3 a.m. Uh, I've been playing it solo and just playing through the tutorial just to get a handle for the rules. This is a uh, game by Nigel Buckle and David Turchi with art from Ian O'Toole, uh, published by Mind Clash Games. It's shipping out to backers at the moment. It was kickstarted about 18 months ago, I think. I think that's right. And it's shipping out to backers at the moment, but my copy is still on a boat. So it's uh, going to be a few weeks before I have my physical copy. So I've really just been trying to brush up on the rules, and when I started doing that, I, I got really obsessed with it and just started playing the Tabletop Simulator module. And I am loving the heck out of this thing. So today we're going to play through the tutorial scenario. If I jump in uh, to the setup, there is, uh, for the different player counts, one through four, there's different versions of the tutorial map. We're going to play the one-player version today. I am the yellow player. And then we have to pick a house. There are 14 houses in the game. They are rated from complexity 1 to complexity 4 for the tutorial. You only have access to the complexity 1 uh, houses. And uh, there are 4 complexity 1, 4 complexity 2, 3 complexity 3, and 3 complexity 4. And they're, they're kind of in order of, of that complexity on uh, in this list. Now I did roll a d4 before starting this video, so we are going to pick the first house because it came up as 1. And we are going to be playing as House Valness. So we'll let Tabletop Simulator do its thing, set up all the components they need to be set up. Now I did uh, just briefly set up some cameras uh, before this. So let me jump around and have a look, make sure they're all still working and pointed at approximately the right things. They are. So the first thing that the Tabletop Simulator module set up for us is the map. This is straight out of the, I think it's in the compendium book, the, the setup guide with all the tutorial stuff. Uh, it's made up of five basic sectors and one home sector, one basic home sector. So the, all these home sectors are the same. If you have the physical copy of the game, all of these tiles are double-sided and they have something else on the other side. Uh, so most of the tiles are going to be these basic tiles on one side and then there'll be a special kind of tile on the other side. But for your uh, tutorial session, you don't need the, the special sides, you only need the basic sides. And it set them up and loaded them up with things and we'll talk about what those things are hopefully, as we go through. The other thing that it did for us is it set up our galactic civilization map. And typically when you're playing Voidfall, uh, the the setup is, uh, once you've selected your scenario this, the, and then the, the play account, the setup is pretty fixed up until you get to this point. So once you've picked a house, uh, then you have a few more choices to make. So this is as far as the tabletop simulator module went. This is our galactic civilization board. Uh, it is showing us the all of the advances that we can get for our house on these three civilization tracks and it's got places for us to put our technology across the top and to put our agendas across the bottom and some other components need to hang out here on the left of the board and again we'll talk about what those as they are when they come up and if you have the physical copy of the game on the back of your house mat there will be a little reference guide that kind of shows you things about your house. So on the left there's that complexity one uh, for the complexity rating. There's a little bit of information about the play style. In the middle you get some beautiful artwork by you know tool there and some uh, lore about house wellness. Then there are uh, two basic uh, origins that you can have when you pick a house. So each of your 14 houses has a setup card, like an origins card, that tells you your starting uh, position on the board, on the map, and it also tells you which technology that you start with. And each house can potentially have special focus cards and special house abilities and things to set us up, um, to, to make the game uh, highly asymmetrical. So each of these houses plays a little bit differently within the same rule set. So you're all playing with the same rules, but you are typically going for different things. Um, so once you learn the game, being able to mix up the houses and do different things is going to be, uh, you'll, you'll get a different game every time. Even if you only play every house once, that's 28 games of Voidfall that you would need to play to even see all of them. Uh, and that doesn't count the fact that there is a bunch of different scenarios for you to play. Uh, for the tutorial scenario, we have to pick Origin A. So of these two origins, we're going for the, the top one, the military approach. 
tells me to uh, I'm going to be starting with the shields technology, and it suggests that I use shields to expand and defend my sectors, concentrate on the statecraft track, which we'll go and look at in a minute, and we need to upgrade our corvette fleets with combat technologies. And again, we'll talk about what all of those things are as we go along. I'm going to take these these two origins cards, which is kind of the um, the, the actual setup information for those things. And in Tabletop Simulator, these are actually labeled the wrong way around. So if I hover over this one, it will show up with uh, Valness A, and this one will show up with Valness B. But if you actually look at the top middle of the card, it does have that letter A and B, uh, so you can get them the right way around. So we'll get rid of this Escape Pods one because we're not going to use it, and we're going to get rid of this Escape Pods technology um, because that's related to that Origins B card, which we're not going to use. We're going to be doing Origins A, this... Uh, shields technology one. So just make sure that the technology matches uh, what it says on the back of your reference card there. So the first thing I'm going to do uh, in the top right, it says shields is my starting technology. I have a couple of cards here. There should be three of each technology card, or there should be three cards related to every technology. There'll be an advanced one, which has got this uh, white symbol in the top left corner. We don't want that one just yet, so I'm going to put that one aside. Later on in the game, I may be able to develop advanced shields, but I don't start with them. I just start with the, the basic shields technology card, which has got the black symbol in the top left corner. We're not going to look too much about this card at the moment, but just know that it gets tucked into under your Galactic Civilization board. There are five slots across the top of your board for basic technologies. So we're going to start with shields, which is cool. Our ships are going to be able to take a few more hits throughout the game, and uh, hopefully that will give us some kind of advantage. Now, the next thing I like to do during setup is grab these components, uh, which are by my influence dial over here. This is, uh, I've got fleet power cubes. You should have 14 of these, and you should have two dice, one in your player color and one standard sort of purpley colored one. I'm going to grab those, bring them over here, and I'm just going to look at my setup card to figure out what, what things I need to take over to my starting sectors, which is in the bottom right of the card. Uh, so it looks like I'm going to need four fleet power over there, uh, it was meant to click and drag and select those to move them closer to the dice. And then I'm going to grab all of these components and we are going to go over to our um, starting sectors here. And it's kind of laid them all out funky, but that's fine. We can fix that. So at the start of the game, we're going to have two sectors that we're in control of. First one is our home sector, which is this one. Uh, it's got the little uh, home sector icon uh, in the left corner here. Uh, it's got some special icons indicating that there are special rules related to this sector. Uh, I'm not going to go into them too much, but basically it means your home sector is safe. It's not going to be invaded by anybody, and uh, the the corruption, the void, is not going to come in here. So the Voidborn aren't going to come in here and, and mess your stuff up. So your home sector is safe. If I look at the, uh, oh, and then the, the other sector that you get is usually just one next to your home sector. This is your outpost sector. And this is just a basic sector. There's nothing special about it. It's every other basic sector in the game works in pretty much exactly the same way. So on our uh, origins card, our starter card here, it's got our two sectors on the right hand side there. Uh, the, the purple hexagons. The top one's got the little uh, house icon, that's our home sector, and then the bottom one has just got the uh, standard sector kind of symbol, the, the hexagon. Uh, and it shows us what's in each one. So in our home sector, we need a shipyard uh, and a uh, farmer's guild. It will have a population of two, which is uh, the, the die symbol there showing a two, and it's got two fleet power worth of corvettes. Uh, I can talk about what those are as we go through them. So the installation, our shipyard, is already printed on the board, so we don't need to add another one here. This is just the one you get. So for the starting uh, for House Valness, they just get the, the starting shipyard, which is already here. Uh, these are the installations of these triangular things at the top of each sector. You can see, like in our outpost sector, there's space to build three more. Uh, and this right-hand one will cause us to have to pay upkeep. That's what this red symbol means, so it's going to be a little bit more expensive. Uh, so we've already got the installation. We also need, I said, a farmer's guild. That's that green cog-like icon. There's a stack of them up here. So let's grab this and we'll drop it down. The tabletop simulator module has some awesome snap points for all of these sector tiles, which is very handy. Uh, these just slot into place. Uh, and then I also said it had a population of two. 
uh, for your home sector, take your uh, the dice that's coloured with your um, your faction, the colour that you're playing. I'm playing yellow. Uh, put it to the value indicated on the origin card and just drop it in this space here. This is where the population for a sector is going to live. It's measured with dice, but don't worry, you're never going to roll them. This is just a counter. It counts from one up to six. So those are the, the values of population that you can have in a sector. Now, these two things here, the population and the guilds, are uh, inextricably linked. So when I go and set up my resource dials in a minute, you'll see that I have uh, two population worth of farming happening. And if I was to uh, have an engineer's guild, which I'm going to need in a minute to set up my outpost sector, but if I was to have an engineer's guild in this sector as well, then I would have two population worth of farming and two population worth of uh, materials. Um, sorry, this is not an engineer's guild, this is a mining guild. I, normally I have the, the tooltips on and I've turned them off to keep a clean interface for the video. So if I get some terms wrong, I apologize. The pink ones are engineer's guilds, uh, mining guilds, and they produce materials. The yellow ones are engineering guilds and they produce energy. Uh, okay, but we don't start with this mining guild to start with. Uh, actually, I did just want to mention that if later on this goes up to a three, uh, that does mean that the production of all of these guilds goes up by one. So as the population in a sector goes up, your ability to produce resources is also going to go up. Um, okay, so let me look at the the outpost sector also has a population of two. So for this, we're just going to use the standard purple die. Most of the sectors in the game are going to have this uh, standard purple die. There's the ones in player colors, and I think the reason why these are in different colors is just to remind you that this is a home sector and whose home sector it is. Um, a, so you don't invade it, and B, so you know who, who it belongs to if you're going to blockade it and, and throw ships around it, which I guess is something you could do. Uh, in a solo game, though, it's just me and the Voidborn. Uh, so it has a population of two. It also has uh, an Engineer's Guild and a Mining Guild. So let's grab an Engineer's Guild, because I've already got a Mining Guild here, and we'll pop those into our outpost sector to start with. And the last thing in these standing sectors is they each have two fleet power worth of corvettes. And this is really cool. The way this works is uh, we have these miniature stands with space for three cubes. And each of these is going to have two cubes in it at the start of the game. So these are corvette miniatures. I don't know if I try and uh, zoom in on them. I don't know how well you'll actually be able to see them. But so in the uh, in the special edition of the box, you'll actually get these these miniatures with these standees. In the base version, the retail version of the box, you will get a, a cardboard token that has a picture of the Corvette and space for three cubes. So you can track those things around. Now, mostly the standees themselves don't make much of a difference. So hang on, let me put this in my home sector. And I'm just gonna grab another Corvette token for a minute just to just to illustrate a point. I could have, in my outpost sector, I could have one base uh, showing that this is uh, corvettes and it's two fleet power worth of corvettes. But if I have a second standee in here with corvettes and I move one of these cubes over, this also shows that I've got two fleet power worth of corvettes in my outpost sector. So if it sounds like I said the same thing, it's because I did. Uh, effectively, these are exactly the same. Uh, there will be differences once we get different types of ships available to us uh, through technologies, but at the start of the game, all we have are corvettes. And also at the end of a round, uh, or at the end of a turn, sorry, uh, we have to only have two of these plastic miniature bases in a sector. So if I ended up with seven fleet power in the sector, I would have to recall some until it, uh, until it came out of my sector. In fact, I'm going to leave this like this because I'm probably going to move one of these ships out of here at some point, and, and I'm going to leave the other one behind. And that's the other thing is that you can kind of, as long as the ship types match, you can kind of freely mix and match these cubes around the, the things that are in the sector. Uh, so this is a really cool way of, of tracking how much fleet power you have in a sector and what that fleet power represents. This is not, I'm probably going to do this wrong throughout the video. This does not mean I have two corvettes. Uh, a fleet power worth of corvettes might be hundreds or thousands of corvettes. Uh, fleet power is kind of an abstract resource indicating uh, how much of a particular type of fleet you control in a region. So uh, just bear that in mind that if I say I'm moving two corvettes over here, it, I'm 
really. I mean, the, the game is a thing where you should really be measuring it in like decades, and I'm, and I'm moving hundreds of ships around in between sectors. Uh, it's just represented in the game by these, these fleet power tokens. Now, there's a couple of things left to do uh, on our Origins card, but we're done setting up the board, so let's go back to our house mat here. Uh, one thing I need to do is, at the start of the game, I'm going to have two active fleet power. So I'm going to take two of these fleet power cubes, and I'm going to move them over into the active zone. Fleet power on your civilization board kind of represents your ability to command fleets, but maybe fleets that you haven't... Uh, that you haven't built yet, you haven't constructed and you haven't put out in the field. So some of your fleet power is going to be over here on the left in this uh, inactive zone. Uh, that kind of represents fleet power that you, you don't really have command of, you don't have capacity to control that. Fleet power on the right over in this active zone, this represents your ability to deploy fleets. So once they're here over in the right, I can deploy them out onto the board. You can kind of see the symbology here showing the the fleet power moving uh, with the green arrow uh, to the uh, out of the board and, and out onto the map. Uh, so during the game, fleet power is going to be moving between these two zones and in between the board and here. And so I need to be able to control that. I found fleet power to be a bit of a challenge uh, in terms of trying to keep enough fleet power active in order to be able to deploy as much as I'd like to uh, when I want to. And then some things actually cost, some of the actions in the game cost fleet power, so then you have to move it from your active to your inactive side. But in the middle of our Origins card, it says we start with two fleet power active, and then our other eight is just going to be in this inactive zone at the start of the game. 14 fleet power is the total for your for uh, every player so you can only have 14 fleet power total so if you deploy all of that out on the board you can't deploy a 15th one it is a limited resource you only get that many the last thing that i need to set up is my resource dials over here i'm just going to drag my origins card over so i can see all of the controls and i can kind of make out what's on this origins card so on the left here you can see uh, a certain number of um, you can see that rotational arrow on the left there with a certain number of ticks so i just need to tick each one of these dials that many ticks down and that represents how much population i have doing that thing so at the moment i've got two population doing food i've got it says they're three population, but it's got a little plus sign next to it because that means I've really only got two population doing it, but I get an extra one as House Valness to start the game. And I've got uh, two doing uh, mining. So if I go and tick these up, you'll see that there's another uh, number here. Uh, there's an arrow with another number next to this. This is my production yield. So when I try and produce this resource, I'm going to get that many. So uh, these resources are food, energy, and materials. And then the last two are credits and science. Those need to be created uh, using more advanced guilds, which I don't currently have any of. Uh, so you can see, even though I've got two ticks on the food track, even though I've got two population working on it, I'm only producing one food every time that I actually try and produce food. So it's a non-linear scale here. Um, and if you are really keen, you can go in and have a look on the dials. You can see what the next tick will give you and what the next tick down will give you. Uh, so you can see I'm on the threshold of jumping up a jumping up a, a yield level on all of these. So if I can get one more population doing any of these things, my yield will go up. And then on the right, that's how much of this resource I currently have stockpiled. So you can see I start with four food, I start with two energy, two materials, and even though I don't have any population doing it, I do start with three credits and two science, which is nice. So that's our setup. Our setup is now complete. We've, we've got the game completely set up. The last thing to do here is I'm going to take my uh, Origins card and flip it over, because on the back is your starting agenda. I'm just going to slot it here under the board, and then I'll bring it up and we can have a look at it. So your agendas, these are the things that are going to score you uh, influence points throughout the game, which is the, the victory condition is trying to get the most influence points, especially when you are in a competitive scenario, uh, which this kind of is, even though I'm, I'm only competing against myself. For the tutorial, there's just a, a base figure that I have to try and beat. I'm trying to beat 120 influence. If I can make 120 influence across the game, then I have considered to succeed at the tutorial scenario. So how am I going to gain influence? Uh, th this game is full of iconography. It can look a bit like hieroglyphics when you first start, 
But once you've played a game or two, uh, a lot of it becomes very intuitive. It has a very strong visual language. So even if you don't know what a symbol means, you can probably guess and you'll likely be right. The physical copy of the game comes with a four page glossary of uh, what each symbol means. And if I zoom out on Tabletop Simulator, you can see that it is more or less represented here at the bottom, this icon reference sheet. But I've now got to the point where I don't need to look at it most of the time. I, I can pretty much uh, figure out what things are. Uh, so what, are, what does this say? There are three different scoring conditions on this agenda. It says, uh, the left one, the leftmost one says, for every pure sector that I have, that is worth three influence points at the end of a cycle. The middle one says, for every pure sector where I have one or more sector defenses, that's worth one influence point. And then the rightmost one says, for every pure sector that I have with one or more shipyard in it, that's going to be worth two influence points. So you can see with just this agenda alone, reaching 120 is going to take a very long time. And I only have three chances at scoring this agenda throughout the game. So we're going to have to do some more things in order to be able to in, in order to be able to achieve, achieve that objective of getting to uh, 120 influence before the end of the game. And the bottom left, there's a reminder that our starting position starts with uh, one more tick on the the uh, energy ranks, uh, and that's important because sometimes you might gain and lose population and you can always go back to the board and reset your dials to make them say say what that matches and so knowing that there was that extra bump on energy is something that might be important later in the game uh, so it's it's printed on the back of the card as well so that you can see it and then in the bottom right corner you can see those two red icons those two red upkeep icons that tells us that uh, maintaining this agenda is going to cost us two upkeep to upkeep every cycle. So we're going to have to pay in order to keep this agenda around. And in fact, I believe it's not possible to get rid of your starting agenda. I haven't seen an effect in the game that would let you get rid of that starting agenda. So we're going to have to pay that upkeep at the end of the cycle. If we don't, then we will actually lose three influence per upkeep symbol that we can't uh, cover. So that's going to be important. We're going to want to be able to pay that upkeep at the end of the cycle. I keep using the word cycle. What does that mean? Now that we're all set up, let's go and look at the agenda board, at the um, galactic board here. The game is split up into three cycles. Uh, we're going to play through three cycles. One, two, and three. There's a, a galactic event card for each one here. And it, during each one, we can basically follow through the steps that are laid out on this galactic board. Uh, each cycle is made up of three phases. Phase A, which is in blue, is their preparation phase. Uh, and it's got four steps in it, but for the first uh, cycle, we only do step four. So we don't need to worry about the, the other steps here. And I'm not going to explain all of, the, all of the pieces of this until we get to the second cycle and we have to go through it. But the last step is going to be revealing this galactic event card. Then we're going to go through and play into phase B. Phase B is the focus phase in which we're going to be looking at cards in our hands and selecting them and taking a couple of actions off of each card. There are ways to get bonus actions. Uh, it is possible to do it during the first cycle, but I'm not going to do it through for this game because I want to try and limit what I'm explaining as I'm explaining it. And then there's a, a cleanup um, step to the, to the focus phase as well, where we're going to be uh, trying to uh, there's that, that symbol that means we can only have two plastic bases or two uh, fleet tokens in each sector at the end of a turn. Uh, we can only have four glory tokens. Uh, we have to slot agendas into into the bottom of our board, the way we just did with our, our starting agenda. And if we have any trade tokens, we need to store them on those agendas as well. I'll talk about all of those things as they come up. The last phase of a cycle is going to be, uh, I think it's called evaluation. I can't remember. <laughs> so uh, this has got four for four steps to it as well. Uh, first step, the Voidborn are going to come and attack us. Uh, so we need to be ready for that. We need to be prepared for that. Then we need to pay upkeep. Uh, and it's important to remember that the Voidborn attack you before you pay upkeep. So even if you think you kind of have the resources uh, going into the end of a cycle, uh, you need to be aware that the Voidborn might mess things up for you. Uh, the game 
is mostly deterministic. There are very, very few random elements. So it's not like the Voidborn are going to suddenly surprise you and smash you down and, and completely destroy your um, your well-laid plans. Uh, but it is something that you need to keep in mind before you actually get to this point. Uh, step three, we're actually going to look back at our galactic event card, and I'll explain how that works in a minute. And step four, we're going to go through and score all those agendas. Once we've finished the cycle, then we go back to the beginning. We go through the preparation phase, which is going to be steps one, two, three, and then four is going to be the new card. We go through a focus phase again. We go through an evaluation again. Then we do it all again for cycle three. And at the end of the game, if we've scored over 120 influence, then we have won, which is cool. Uh, like I said, for this first cycle, steps one through three of the preparation phase, we just skip. So don't worry about them too much. I'll explain what all those components do as we come up to it. The thing we need to care about at the moment is this is this uh, galactic event card. Oh, I did forget one more thing. Before we look at the galactic event card, I'm going to draw our hand of eight focus cards so that we have them in our hand. Um, but don't worry, we're going to, in a minute, discard a bunch of them so that we've only got three left. So we don't need to don't need to worry overly much. One thing that I should point out, actually, even before we do that is there's this innovation focus card. And you can see on the left there, it's got a uh, an icon indicating not in cycle one. So you, you never start cycle one with your innovation card. It starts on the table. So you, you can't play innovation during the first cycle. So we don't need to worry about that one. We're just going to leave it where it is. Let's look at this galactic event card. Actually, let's look at it on the board for a minute because there is um, something that I want to point out. In this top right corner here, there is a number. This indicates how many focus cards we're going to be able to play uh, this cycle. So this cycle, we're only going to be able to play three focus cards. Uh, later cycles, we're going to be able to play four and then five. So we're going to get more. If, if you're playing the full game and not the tutorial, these cards will be different. And they will have different numbers in this top right corner. So it's always something to be mindful of is how many uh, focus cards am I going to get to play this cycle? Because this game is nothing if not cruel on giving you a 30 options, uh, but you can only pick two of them and picking them in the right order is critically important. So that's the thing to keep an eye on. But uh, this has uh, the galactic, um, is it a galactic event card? I think it's a galactic event card. It has a title. This one's called From the Ashes. It has a, um, a indicator over here indicating uh, which set it comes from and which cycle it's for. So this is the cycle one card from the tutorial set. And each of them will have that that indicator. For the tutorial game, you only use the tutorial cards. For the full game, you'll get uh, a set of three. Or if you're playing a cooperative or solo game, you'll get uh, access to all of them. Uh, this one's called From the Ashes. It has a reminder here. Read the tutorial for Cycle 1 and the Compendium. I have done so many times. I think I've got this down. Then we have a sequence of instructions under here, and these uh, can have different symbols on them. This symbol in the top left corner here with the, the four people is uh, just means every player. So every player do the following. And because it's a solid border, we all have to do this. This is not optional. We've got to do it. So it says discard the following focus cards. So we've got eight focus cards in our hands at the moment. One thing that I really like about the tutorial is it just cuts down on the number of options early on to really uh, let you hone in on how the game works. And it expands your options as you go along, uh, as you get used to the game and figure out what's going on. So we've got to, we've got to get rid of a bunch of these. I know most of the symbols. So conquest is the one with the exploding box. We can chuck that. Politics is people shaking hands. We can get rid of that one. Uh, progress is the the speedy with the arrow. We can get rid of that. Uh, prosperity is the one with the starburst. We can get rid of that one. Temptation is the one with the flames. Well, it's not flames. It's corruption, but it looks like flames to me. And then I can go. I'll go and put that with my innovation card because I'll get them back at the end of the cycle. Okay, so now we're only left with three focus cards left. We'll look at those in a minute because that's when we'll get to play them. The last instruction on this card says that every player has to move the corruption from their civilization board onto their outpost sector. What corruption on our civilization board? The sneaky setup has done this for us. It's actually part of the setup. There is this horrible little thing here sitting on, the, on our last agenda slot. This is a corruption marker. This indicates that the, the Voidborn have somehow infiltrated our house and spread um, amongst our civilization. They can be in a couple of places during the game, but the main places they're likely to be during the, um, the tutorial game are going to be on one of these agenda slots. 
And if they're on an agenda slot, and you'll notice your starting agenda can't be can't be corrupted, but let's imagine for a moment that it, that it could be. If your uh, agenda is uh, corrupted, then you can't uh, score that agenda during the end of the cycle. So you, you really don't want those to be there if you can at all avoid it. It can also be on uh, one of these civilization track markers, which means when that civilization track marker moves up, you don't get the benefit that, that's listed on the board for it. So you can still move the marker, you just won't get anything for it. Um, although there are reasons why you might want to still move the marker anyway, and we'll get into those as they become uh, important. The last thing to be aware of is, remember when I said that the Voidborn are going to attack us at the end of the cycle? The strength of that attack is going to be based on how corrupted your civilization uh, mat is. So if I have one corruption marker here, they're going to attack me with a fleet power of one. If I have two corruption markers on my uh, civilization board, they're going to attack me with a power of two. So I did say it was deterministic, and you will see it coming, uh, but sometimes uh, taking on a little bit of corruption isn't terrible, as long as you are willing to handle it at the end of the cycle. You've got to be prepared for it. The final place where it's likely to be during the tutorial, let me pick this up and we'll go over to our map, is on the map, in a sector. And in that case, it's not your, your house that is corrupted, it is the population of a sector that is corrupted. And these are these cool little figures that the dice just slot neatly into. And if I zoom out a little bit, you'll notice nearly every other sector on the board is corrupted. There is corruption everywhere. We are surrounded by corruption. Even this outpost that we've created is now corrupted. Uh, so we're going to want to get rid of that. This has a couple of effects. First of all, we can't change the population in a corrupted sector. It won't go up and we can't put it down voluntarily to pay for something. Uh, I think there could, in theory, be other effects in the game that could put it down. I haven't seen one, but as far as I know, the, the population in a sector is fixed while it's corrupt. So that's no good, because we would like to increase population in this sector, especially because there's already two guilds here, so it's, it's highly efficient for us to do so. The other reason why we care about corruption in a sector, let's go back to our civilization board and look at our starting agenda. You might have heard uh, me use the word pure on each one of these things. Uh, so score three influence for every pure sector, score one influence for every pure sector with a sector defense, score two influence for every pure sector with a uh, shipyard. Pure means not corrupted. So you can see the little symbol on the left there with the corruption and a little, uh, a little no symbol. Uh, so while that sector is corrupted, we are unable to score anything for that sector. So we would really like to get rid of that corruption uh, this cycle, if we can, before we try and score this agenda. Let's go back to the to the galactic event card, because the final thing that we need to look at here is, remember I said during phase C and evaluation, there is this step three, where we're going to go and look at the uh, galactic event card. That is uh, in order to evaluate these conditions in the purple box. What do I mean? Uh, at the end of the cycle, if we've completed one of these two objectives, then we will get one of these two rewards. Now they're separated by a red line with a slash, which means we only get one of them. So even if we've completed both objectives, we're gonna to have to pick which one that we want to uh, get the reward for. And if we've completed neither of these objectives, then we get nothing. Uh, and you can bet in a multiplayer game, the other players are going to be trying to get some of these and it will give them a leg up for the next cycle. So you absolutely wanna be prepared for these. You wanna know what these are. And if at all possible, you wanna go into the cycle trying to figure out which one you, you are going for um, because although it is possible in the tutorial scenario, I think I've done it once, assuming I didn't make any rules gifts, it is possible to fulfill both of these. You will only get one of the rewards. So you need to decide which one of these things you're going for. Uh, and some of them can have multiple uh, objectives and things going on. So let me uh, interpret the hieroglyphics for you. The, the, this top one is uh, have five or more fleet power deployed on the board. It doesn't matter about corruption in that case. So just getting five fleet power out on the board will let me increase the population in a pure sector and gain one credit and one science. So that, that seems doable because we started with four fleet power on the board. Let's go and look at the board again quickly. We started with four fleet power on the board. We've got one, two, three, four. So all we have to do is put one in and we do have a shipyard. So in theory, we can build one ship and put it out there and it should be, that should do the trick. Let's go back and have a look at this card. The second one says that have five or more guilds in pure sectors. 
And if we do that, then we can deploy one fleet power and we will gain two food. Um, so that also sounds doable. We start with three guilds. Um, the problem with that bottom one is that we need to get rid of that corruption because otherwise the two guilds won't count. And in that case, we've only got one guild in a pure sector. So really, my key objective in this is, can I get uh, two more guilds out or can I uh, put out one more fleet power? And if, I, if I'm doing the guilds one, then I really, really, really want to get rid of this corruption, but I think I want to get rid of it anyway because of my starting agenda. And that's the start of the first cycle. There is plenty of other things that we might want to look at uh, going into a cycle, but for your tutorial uh, scenario, you should probably just stop there and start looking at cards. Uh, if there's one thing I've learned about Void Foil, it's staring at focus cards and trying to reorder them in my hand to, to put them in somewhat of a semblance of a strategy to get me what I want. Uh, so trying to figure out at a high level going into a cycle what it is that you want to achieve is important. So with that said, let's move on. We've now finished the preparation phase. Let's look at um, phase B, which is the focus phase. Uh, step one of phase B, of the focus phase, is going to be to select one focus card from our hand and do two actions on it. There's ways to get other actions, but realistically at the moment, this is, this is the thing that you should be focusing on. So play one focus card, play two actions on it. They must be different actions. So let's look at a, at a couple of focus cards. Uh, let me see. There we go. Okay, so focus cards are the, the that is the focus for your civilization for uh, some period of time. And as I said before, you can probably measure this in like decades or or at the very worst, like handfuls of years. This is what is my what is my civilization doing uh, during this time? Is it focused on reinforcement? Is it focused on development? Or is it focused on production? And I can do each one of these once uh, during a cycle. Uh, these are the only ones that are available to me. So let's look at reinforcement first. Reinforcement, uh, I need to, uh, there are three actions on it. I can accelerate, muster, or mobilize. If I choose to accelerate, then I need to uh, pay the cost in white at the top. Actually, let me drag this out and drop it on the table and we'll zoom in because then I can point at things a bit easier. Uh, okay, so you can't actually see that, that's a pain. Here we go. Yeah, here we go. So uh, this first action here, this accelerate, uh, you can see there's, there's a white box at the top here. This is the cost of doing this action. So if I wanna accelerate, I need to do this. I need to pay this cost, which is deactivate a fleet power. And if I do, then I get the benefit, which is the part in black. Uh, this is, I can advance on one civilization track and I can place a sector defense. Sector defenses are just gonna hold off attacks. Uh, in this scenario, because I don't have other players to worry about, this is just going to deal with help me deal with those um, the Voidborn coming after me at the uh, at the end of the cycle. So that sounds pretty good. Um, it doesn't really help me achieve any of my any of those stated objectives that I had. The next action that I had here is muster. It's going to cost me two materials, and then I can deploy fleet power. Uh, equal to the number of shipyards I've got, but they have to go into those shipyards. Like they have to go into the sectors where those shipyards are. That's what this little equal symbol means. So if I go and look out on the board, I've got one shipyard, so I could deploy one fleet power at this shipyard, so in this sector. So I would go and grab one of my uh, active fleet power cubes and drop it into this uh, plastic uh, standee. Or I can grab a second standee and drop it in here because at the end of the turn, I just have to have uh, a maximum of two. The last action that I can take here is mobilize this one. Uh, for mobilize, I spend one energy and then I can move uh, five fleet power around on my board and I can deploy a sector defense. So this muster one would actually allow us to achieve that top goal on the objective, assuming we don't lose any fleet power for the rest of the cycle. Um, but I do actually want to hold off on doing that just at the moment. Uh, let's look at some of the other ones. Development is going to let me kind of increase uh, what's going on in each one of my sectors. So you can see here uh, I've got Grow, uh, which lets me uh, spend a material to place a guild or place an installation. 
I've got settle, which requires me to deactivate a fleet power. So I've actually got to, um, sorry, uh, recall, recall a fleet power. So I take it off of a sector on the board and bring it back onto my galactic civilization board. It remains active, um, but it, it kind of means that the, the people manning those vessels have gone on to do other jobs. Uh, that will allow me to establish a guild and put in an installation. So those both sound good. And then the last one here is harmonize. I spend a science and I can increase the population of a pure sector or I can remove a corruption. Now, removing a corruption is a thing I absolutely want to do this cycle. Uh, but before we, uh, before I look at that, let's look at the production card, uh, which is our last option here. Production, uh, I can thrive. It has no cost, uh, but I'm just going to move up one of the civilization tracks. And we'll go and look at the civilization tracks in a minute. Uh, I can supply, which has no cost, but it will produce food, uh, energy, and materials. So remember I said we had a certain amount of production based on the guilds and the population in the sectors where those guilds are. Um, so if we go and look at our resource style, I think I had one, two, and one. So at the moment, if I were to do supply, I would gain one food, two energy, and one materials. And then because, whoop, and then because these are separated by a green line with the, the and or kind of symbol here, I would, I would also then do this part as well. So I would get one influence per uh, uh, guild in a pure sector that is of the food materials or energy. Um, so either the green, pink, or, or yellow there. And then the last one I've got here is uh, optimize. That's going to cost me a food and an energy, and then I can remove a uh, corruption from somewhere, either from my galactic civilization board or from a sector that I control and or I can move five fleet power around. Uh, so, uh, now, now I've ended up in some weird state. I don't know how to reselect the pointer. That's F1, okay. Cool, I remember that for next time. So let me put this back in my hand because there's a couple of things we should go and look at. Uh, first of all, let's look at our galactic civilization board here. Uh, the, um, the resource dials here. Remember I said that if we were to do production, we would produce one food, two energy, uh, one materials. We've actually got, I think, plenty of food materials and energy for what we're doing here. And if we were to take the uh, the development one, we would be adding guilds to the board. So that would, that would um, it would be silly to do production just yet. Uh, but the, the top action on the production card is Thrive. Um, so if I look at these three uh, tracks here. I can move up on the Thrive track and I'll get this this first benefit uh, when I land on this space, which is one credit and one science, which would be good. Um, credits can be used to replace any of the any of the things above it on the on the resource dials here. So if I need to pay three energy for something, but I've only got two, I can pay two in energy and pay one in in credits. Uh, it can't be used that way during upkeep, and we'll talk about upkeep when we get there. So that's a thing to be to be wary of. Uh, the best thing to pay for upkeep with is food. So you want to keep enough food to cover your upkeep if you can. Uh, or you have a house power that lets you do something different. All right, I have just been talking for a very long time, and uh, I don't think we've got to any gameplay yet. So let's dive straight in and pick one of these cards to play. And I think what I want to play first of all is this uh, development card, this development focus card. So during the, um, I'm going to pick a card. I've done that. Uh, so that there is a selection, fa uh, yeah, a selection phase to the uh, focus phase. That, that doesn't sound right because he used phase twice. There's a selection step to the focus phase. Uh, the next thing that I need to do, if I go and look at the Galactic Civilization board here, is pick two actions on that card, but they can't be the same action. So I can't take the same action twice, but I, I can only do two of them. So let's go and look at this card. I want to do, uh, I want to settle, and I know that seems counterintuitive because it means that I'm actually going against uh, uh, putting more fleet power onto the board. Uh, in fact, this card by itself can be used to satisfy either of those conditions, because uh, we could use it to, to drop two, um, Oh no, it couldn't. Not unless we not unless we had a trade token, which I'm not even going to explain just yet. Uh, so I'm going to start by settling. Is really the point here. Um, I'm going to recall a fleet power, which is going to let me uh, uh, establish a new guild and install a new installation. So to uh, 
recall a fleet power. I'm going to pick it up. I'm just going to take the, the token off there. And let's go over to our Galactic board. And I'm going to drop it back in the active. So you can see when it comes off of the board, it comes in through this little chute and lands in your, your active section. So I've now paid the cost of doing that. Then it says, uh, establish a guild in the same sector where you record fleet power. So I can't recall fleet power from my home sector and then establish a guild somewhere else. I've, I've got to do it in the sector where I'm doing it. And then uh, I have to be able to produce, I, I have to create another guild. So I have a few options here. I could create any of the five guilds. Uh, there are five different types of guild in the game that all produce different resources. I could produce any of them. However, I think because I'm covering up one of these uh, upkeep icons and I just said that I want to make sure that my food supplies are high enough and I want to make sure that I'm, I'm not demonstrating how to play too badly <laughs> I am going to put a uh, food guild in here now whenever you establish a new guild you should look at the population of the sector that you're establishing it in and go and update your resource style so this is two more ticks on the food production go over to our board here two more ticks on our food production takes us from producing one food uh, whenever we produce food to now producing three food every time we produce food. So that's good. I'm happy with that. Uh, but I also get to put in an installation. There are only two types of installation available to us in the tutorial scenario. You can ignore these starbase, these purple starbase icons. Um, we have shipyards, which let us deploy fleet power on, out onto the board. And we have sector defenses, which are going to cause damage to ships as they approach our sector. And honestly, if you have star bases, they're just a combination of those two things. Kind of. There's, there's a few rules elements that mean that that statement's not true, but don't, don't worry about it too much. They're basically star bases and sector defenses at the same time. I'm going to deploy a shipyard. Uh, I'm not going to explain too much why at this point, because I think I've done too much talking already. Uh, and then I do get a second action here. I, I could grow or I could harmonize. I can't settle again because my two actions have to be different. I'm going to choose to harmonize. And although I would really love to increase population somewhere, actually the best place for me to produce population at the moment is the place that's corrupted and you can't. Uh, you can see in the harmonize it's a increase population, I increase a, uh, a pure population, increase a, a population that is uh, not corrupted. And the one population that I'd really dearly like to increase is this one, but it's corrupted, so I can't do that. So let's take this harmonize action. I need to start by paying the cost, pay one science. Let's tick down one science there. Uh, and then take either of those two, either of those two um, benefits. I'm going to take the remove corruption one. So to do that, we're just going to lift our little dice out, remove our corruption token, and put it back. Hooray! Our people have been purified. I'm sure it was painless for everyone. Okay, that's one card out of three. Let's let's try and rocket through some of these, shall we? So uh, next up, I can take the reinforcement action uh, or the production action. Now, I'm probably ready to take the production action because I'm probably not going to put out another guild. In fact, I think, looking at my... Let me look at my resource tracks. Yeah, I can't. Uh, I can't put out another guild at this point. So I've already given up on one of those galactic objectives. Um, so it doesn't really matter overly much. I don't think which order I do these things in at the moment based on what I want to do. I guess in theory, I might want to optimize and move my ships around once I've deployed them. Uh, in this case though, I'm, I'm perfectly happy not to. So let's do this reinforcement. And I'm going to take the top two actions here. I'm going to accelerate and then muster. So to accelerate, I have to pay the cost, which is to deactivate fleet power. Let's take a fleet power and put it in my deactive zone. I've only got two active fleet power. Remember when I said I struggle with fleet power? It might be because of the way I played this game. Uh, then I can improve one of my civilization tracks and drop a sector defense in a sector. So I'm going to start by dropping the sector defense because there's no choices there. I'm just going to go and put it in the sector. I'm going to put it in this sector. There's a couple of reasons. Uh, one, nobody can ever attack your home sector, so I don't need to defend it. Um, and two, because it's going to help when the Voidborns start attacking me very shortly. When I run out of cards to play, they're going to, they're going to attack me. Uh, but then I get to move up one of these civilization markers. So which one am I going to do? I can go, uh, if I move the, uh, I forget what these are called. Normally they're in the, the society one. So if I move the society one, I'm going to get one credit and one science, and that's it. But then I do have these increased population uh, steps along the way. 
which is something that I, I would dearly love to do. Uh, this one here, this growth one, uh, th these arrows mean basically when you get here, the benefit is that you skip this space and move to the next space. Uh, it's important to know that that is a benefit because it means that if this marker is corrupted, you don't get that benefit when you move on to that space. It's just a waste. Uh, so try and avoid that if you can. Um, so I would move directly up to here, which would get me a trade token. I'm not going to explain trade tokens just yet, so I'm not I'm not going to take this action, even though it would probably be good for me in this situation. Uh, should I? No, I'm going to keep things simple for the first cycle. So the last one is this um, statecraft track. Uh, when you move that, you can activate a fleet power. Remember I just complained about uh, fleet power? Uh, so I think this might be my best bet because uh, it will stop me from, from whinging about not, not having enough fleet power in the, in the next cycle. Uh, and as you move up these tracks, the benefits get greater and greater until you get to the end when you get to uh, do all kinds of crazy shenanigans. Um, although the, the costs of entering those tracks are going to go up as well. So at the moment, uh, this has cost me nothing. So all I have to do is move this marker here and then take the benefit, which is activate a fleet power. So it cost me a fleet power. And then I got a fleet power in response. So the, the net cost of that for me was nothing, but it, the net benefit was nothing as well, other than I got to place that sector defense. One more action off of this card. Uh, it's got to be either muster or mobilize. I'm going to muster because I want to get those five fleets out on the board. I've already given up on five guilds, but five fleet power out on the board seems like something that's achievable now. Um, I have to spend two materials. Oh no, I'm out of materials. We'll fix that in a minute. And then I can deploy one fleet power per shipyard, but they have to be in equal equal sectors to the shipyard. They have to be in the places where I have ships. So if I go and look at the board, I've got two shipyards out on the board, one in my home sector and one over here in my outpost. So I can deploy two fleet power, but they have to go into these two sectors. So let's go and... Whoop, don't need that third one. You can stay there. Uh, let's pick up these two fleet power, go over to the board. And... Then pick up each one. I love the snap points in this module for some reason. It just really excites me. And I'm going to drop one into each one of these kind of um, these Corvette fleets that I've got going on. So that is two actions of reinforcement. Last focus for the round. Going to do production. I'm going to do the top two actions here as well. Uh, one is to move up the. Uh, I've already forgotten what it was called. Society track. <laughs> Clearly, I'm not a society guy. One is to move up the society track. So you can see here that I, I could have had the opportunity to move up twice on the society track because I could have done that once last turn and then once this turn and actually increase population here. That might have actually been a good idea, but too late. I've already taken the action. I'm I'm going to try not to do tech backsies in this uh, because even though it's solo, you're all watching and, and you don't want to get frustrated with that. So we're going to move this over here. We will get one credit and one science. Ah, wrong way. We get we get one credit and one science. <laughs> Taking away resources before I've before I've managed to get them. That is uh, the first action on production. Then I get one more, which is supply. I'm going to produce food, energy, and materials. Let's come over here. I'm going to produce three food. One, two, three. I'm going to produce two energy. One, two. I'm going to produce oh, only one materials. I'm going to regret not not producing a materials guild. Although I do have four credits, so that should be that should be fine. And then I'm going to gain uh, one influence for every uh, for every guild that is uh, a farmer's guild, a miner's guild, or an engineer's guild in pure sectors. So both of my sectors are pure, and I have four guilds of those types. Uh, so I will earn four influence, and you'll never guess what. Viewers, we're on the board. We have a score now. We have 14 influence. We start with 10 because, in theory, if you don't pay your upkeep, you can lose some. Um, but we've got 14 influence out of 120. We're on our way. Uh, it is going to take forever to get there at this rate, though. Let me draw those cards back into my hand. I'll grab these ones that I discarded before. That's all of them. And then we can move on uh, out of... Uh, the focus phase and into the evaluation. So, whew, first thing that is going to happen here is a uh, Voidborn skirmish. Now, if this was cycles two or three, the Voidborn would attack me with additional fleet power, but at the moment they're going to be attacking me with zero. I have no corruption on my galactic civilization board. And although there's plenty of corruption out here in the galaxy, ah, it's not affecting me at the moment. So they're going to attack me with zero. 
let's imagine for a minute that they were going to attack me with one. Let's go and grab a fleet power token from up here. I'm not sure why the mod leaves those up there. I feel like they would be better suited. Let's grab them. I feel like these would be better suited down here somewhere so that we had easier access to them. So let's assume they were going to attack us with a fleet power of one just for the sake of illustration. Well, in that case, the way combat works uh, is there are two steps. And this is all illustrated on this handy dandy board up here in the corner. Here we go. The way this is, the way this works, it happens in in kind of two basic steps. There is an approach step, in which uh, ships that are approaching can shoot at each other, and then there is a salvo step. And then if there are any ships remaining, then we do another salvo step. And then if there are any ships remaining, there's another salvo step. So we we keep going until one side or the other has blown the other away. And this is completely deterministic, and I believe there is a companion app coming that will do a bunch of this math for you. If you find it difficult or you um, you, you just don't want to run through it in your head every single time. Uh, so uh, the types of ships that we care about, or the, the types of things that we care about, are only the first two rows. Um, so let me read them for you. Uh, I'll, I'll interpret the hieroglyphics. On the, uh, the top row is sector defenses. And what that says is, in defense, sector defense will deal one approach damage per sector defense you have in the sector. Once you get to the salvo step, they don't do anything. So they're kind of stationed on the edge of your sector and they prevent people from coming in. So if people try and come in, they're going to shoot. Uh, the second row there, which are the ships that I have at the moment, the corvettes, uh, and also the voidborn fleets are also corvettes. Um, you can see in, at the, in the very top row, they're, they do nothing on approach, for starters. They, they just fly uh, and probably get shot. Once you get to the salvo step, uh, you can see there's a, an exclamation mark there. That indicates that ships of that type um, are going to uh, produce initiative. So during the salvo step, you're going to count up the number of uh, ship. You're going to count up the initiative on each side of the combat and see who has the higher initiative. Uh, if one if one side or the other has higher initiative, they will deal one damage to the opposing side. Then the the opposing side will calculate their initiative again, and if they have any left, they will fire back and deal one damage. So let's look at what that would look like. Let's say the Voidborn were attacking me in this sector, where I've got two fleet power and this sector defense. If that were the case, uh, during the approach step, my sector defense is going to shoot down uh, one of the one of the voidborn, and then when we get to the salvo step, the the voidborn have no initiative, and I would win the combat. Let's assume we don't have this sector defense in here for the minute. Now, during the first salvo step, we're going to calculate initiative for corvettes and for voidborn fleets. That is going to be one per fleet power that's there. So I've got two initiative. The voidborn fleet has one. So because I've got the higher initiative, I'm going to deal one damage to the voidborn fleet. And then that'll recalculate their initiative. It's zero, so they don't fire back. Uh, so my ships are all safe. Let's start increasing the size of the fleet and see what happens. Here, when we calculate our initiative, we both have two. Now, unfortunately for me, when that's even, both sides will deal damage, one damage to each other at the same time. Then we recalculate initiative for the next salvo step. We've both got one, so we both deal one damage to the other at the same time. At this point, it's a tie. We both lose. It's mutually assured destruction. And unfortunately for me, that means I lose control of this sector. And doubly unfortunately for me, when somebody abandons a sector, the void, the Voidborn move in. So they'll actually take over the sector. So even though it's a tie in the combat, the, the Voidborn kind of win that combat. Let's go the other way. What happens if the Void comes in, the Voidborn come in with a bigger fleet? If the Voidborn come in with three fleet power, then when we cal calculate initiative, they will do one damage to me uh, because they have an initiative three and I have an initiative two. So they deal damage first. Then I recalculate my initiative. I've got one, so I deal one damage to them. Now we recalculate initiative again. They've got two and I've got one. They've got the higher initiative, so they deal one damage to me. I recalculate my initiative and it's zero so I don't take out any more of them, and I lose the sector. So you can see, as the as the Voidborn fleets start to get bigger and bigger in size, you're going to have more and more of a problem, as you have to try and deal with uh, these corrupted ships coming at you. 
But for now, they're going to attack me with a, a fleet power of zero. So uh, let's take all these cubes off of here. So they attack with zero. I would do one damage on approach, but there's nothing to damage. And then I would win initiative and they would lose the combat. It's important to note that uh, the Voidborn still do technically attack you, even if they have a fleet power of zero. And that's important because you might have something that gives you um, some bonus for winning a combat. Uh, in that case, you have technically won a combat. It's just that no one ever showed up on the other side. So they, the Voidborn kind of forfeited <laughs> in that case. Anyway, that is the first step here. And you can see during uh, cycles two and three, they're going to attack with more uh, fleet power, um, but only plus one. So at the moment, they would be attacking me with a one, which means just having one sector defense is kind of good enough to hold them off. Uh, it's not really the Voidborn you need to worry about in this tutorial scenario. It's more if you can actually get at one of the other players. And because I haven't played the tutorial multiplayer, I don't even know if that's physically possible. The next step of the evaluation phase is we need to pay for upkeep. We're going to find upkeep icons in our sectors and on our agendas, on our uh, galactic civilization boards. Um, so we have... Uh, we do have one here, but there's nothing in this installation space, so we don't need to pay for it. It's only if we actually fill up the installations in this sector that we that this is going to be a problem. This one, uh, we do have to pay for because there's a farmer's guild here. And then there's one more here, but again, that space is not filled, so we don't need to worry about it. So our upkeep here is one. If we go back and look at our board here, our agendas, we have uh, just in that bottom right hand corner, there is two upkeep icons. So we have to pay for three upkeep. And let's jump back to the Galactic Civilization board and just zoom in a little bit and take a look. You can pay for upkeep uh, with uh, one food or two energy or materials in any combination. So it could be two energy, it could be two materials, it could be one energy and one material, however you want to do it. But the most efficient way to do it is with food. So I've got three upkeep I need to pay, and luckily I've got seven food, which is so much. Maybe I should have put down a, a miner's guild at the start of the game, but seven food, uh, I, I'm going to get pay my three food, and that's my upkeep covered. So that's step two covered. Now we get to step three, the evaluation. Uh, do we have five fleet power on the board? We do. Do we have five or more guilds on the board in pure sectors? We do not. So we get to do this this top action. We don't get to do the... We, we don't even get the option to do the bottom one. But remember, we have to choose between uh, which one of these two we want to get. So we have five fleet power on the, on the board. We get to increase the population in a pure sector and then gain... A, uh, and or... <laughs> I'm not sure why you would pick or. I guess you could choose not to increase population if you had a strong reason for that. But... I don't see why you would in the in the tutorial scenario. Um, actually, one of the tiebreakers for where the Voidborn attack is population in a sector. So I guess in theory, uh, but it's, it's kind of after they've attacked. So eh, it, it, you could choose not to take it, but I'm not sure why you would. And the same for the other side. Uh, one credit, one science. Let's just add those quickly so that we don't have to think about it anymore. Um, and then increase the population in a pure sector. So we could increase population here, uh, which would get us one more tick of farming. Um, or if we increase population here, which is absolutely what we're going to do, uh, then we get one more uh, rank of engineering, mining, and farming. So let's go over here. One more rank of farming, engineering, and mining. Ah, oh, look at that. Now we're way better at producing materials. Ah, uh, I wish we could do production now. I got bad news. Uh, but I'll get to that in a minute. The final step of evaluation is that you get to uh, score influence based on the pure agendas on your Galactic Civilization board. Let's look at our agenda. We get three influence for every pure sector we control. Uh, we control two, our outpost sector and our home sector. We weren't able to move out of these sectors uh, for the first cycle. That is always the, the case. That's just the way it is. Um, so we're going to get, uh, what was it? Was it three influence each for those? Yep, three influence for each of those, and we've got two of them. So we're going to get six more influence. We're up to 20 influence out of 120. We're one-sixth of the way to victory. All right. Uh, then we get one influence for every pure sector with a sector defense. We have one sector with a sector defense. It's in our outpost sector. So we're going to get one influence for that. 
it all adds up. It's it's kind of a point salad -y mechanic, um, but you get to control uh, the ingredients that go into the salad. So if you if you don't like uh, one particular ingredient, then you don't have to include it in your salad. It's great. I love it. Um, the last uh, the last scoring opportunity on this agenda is we get two influence for every sector with uh, for every pure sector with one or more shipyards on it. We have two. There's one in our home sector and one in our outpost sector. Now note, even if we built another one here, we're scoring for the sector, not for the not for the the actual installations. So we would still only score for two of these sectors. But still, that is four more influence. Ah, look at that. We're almost there. 25 out of 120. Uh, don't worry, this is going to accelerate as we add more agendas along the bottom here, which we could not have done during the the first uh, the first cycle. So, but that is the end of the first cycle. We're now up to the start of the second cycle. I have been talking for what feels like two hours now, so I am going to take a break, and I might come back with another video. Talk to you soon. Bye bye.